Super progressive. What is good? It just such a special episode today for two reasons. First of all, on the Super Progressive Podcast, we have, you may notice that it's been taken up a level, and that's yeah. because of our brand new uh, co-host, Ruben from Columbia, bro. Ruben, hey how guys. are you doing? You guys might know him from the Linear Podcast that he does. He leaves yeah. amazing, amazing comments on the Super Progressive channels, and now he's the co-host of the podcast, bro. Thank you so much for all the work behind the scenes you've been doing, and welcome aboard, man. Hey, it's a it's an awesome pleasure. It's an honor. And I can't believe I'm just doing this now. So it's it's my new point in life. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And now this episode is special. Additionally, because of our amazing guest today, we've been featuring more and more legendary producers. And today on Super Progressive, we have like an absolute treat. Now, today joining us will be Chris Scott, and you may know his productions because they've been on the forefront of the progressive sound that we explore on Super Progressive. You may recognize him from Lexicon Avenue, and you may recognize him from Echo Men, or you may recognize him as the lead man of Forensic Records. But through it all, and Ruben can add a little bit more right here, but Man, we're just so stoked for you uh, to be on the podcast today and to hear stories about all of this. Chris has so very, many aliases. Man. Yeah, there's so many yeah, aliases. Oh, man. You know, I was asked to make a list and then um, there's some ones that I've even forgotten about, like one-offs, you know, that I, I've even forgotten about. And there's, there's friends of mine like Darren Drake. He's like, you did, you did this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I did do that. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's like Little Green Man, <laughs> Mooncat. Little Green Men and Mooncat, they were big ones and stuff. And I think, you know, Lexicon and Echo Men, they're the ones that sort of put us on the map and took us around the world playing. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for it, but we, we, we did try and push, uh, the boundaries of what we, what we started off because we were getting into this whole thing with a tougher beat from the Deep House stuff. And we, we just had our own take on it. So it's, it, it kind of, so the, the sort of melodic harking back to the eighties sound was the echo men stuff and the tougher, more sort of tribal influence. I think that John Digwood started playing mm -hmm. that we did was, was the lexicon sound. So we, we had that, I had the two different things. I was producing with Anton for one and I was producing with Scott and Mark for the lexicon and, um, you know, it just kind of took off. It was a bit of a whirlwind, really. It was. Yeah. I, I got to listen to it and play it a lot. You should have seen yeah. everybody just going crazy here in, in, in Colombia, where I'm at. It, it was yeah, yeah. really global. It's fantastic. It was such an honor and a pleasure to play all those tracks. It's, Thank you. Thanks very much. You know, I, what, uh, one thing I didn't get it to, one thing I failed to mention in my intro that I'm also excited for us to be talking about is not only there's the work as lexicon avenue and echo men for your own productions but your remix work too for all these different djs and i think what i'm yeah. excited to hear in this interview is you know how all these different djs that kind of had all their different sounds chose to showcase your records on their mix compilations and in the yes. club and i just yes. can't wait can't wait to get into it all but we got to go back to the beginning bro because like you don't just yeah. you don't just start creating legendary progressive house tracks. It all starts somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah. like, where does your story with music begin? Well, it's crazy. You, um, kind of when. Well, I mean, if you how far back do you want to go? But um, I, yeah, I, so way I, back I as you can. Um, <laughs> I went to comprehensive school. I'm going to lower my seat here. I went to comprehensive school with, uh, with, uh, and like, I really only connected with a couple of guys that, who, who were into the same electronic music as me. Um, one of them became, uh, an act in the UK called Zero B. Now he was big in the rave scene and we started producing together. We started sort of making sounds together, basically. And I had like, like Saturday jobs and pocket money and stuff like this that, 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 that kind of uh, I would just keep saving 
and buy a little bit of equipment. And electronic equipment in the sort of mid eighties was starting to go really cheap. Um, so we would buy stuff and we would learn it and then we would jam together. And anyway, he, he became like a big rave act in the UK and, um, I was just messing around and, and, um, then, you know, I started doing this radio show, like an underground radio show in sort of 1989, 1990. And I wasn't ready. I was just throwing sounds together. I just didn't have, and I was kind of getting wasted a lot. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought I had this, uh, this epiphany where I was at this place. I was, I was on stage and I shouldn't have been on stage. I wasn't ready for it. And, um, it, it just went down like it just bombed. And at that point I thought, you know, this was like 1991. I thought, look, if you're either going to do this properly, you know, I, I was like a kid, you're either going to do this properly or you're not going to do it at all. So make a choice. And I just stopped getting wasted and learned the skills. And I took shitty jobs to buy very expensive equipment. And I just threw myself into like being this hermit that would, you know, l find out everything about. And like, so I would hear tracks. I would put my, my friend had his 1210s in my room at this shared flat. And I would put this track on. And I would listen to my music and go, well, why doesn't mine sound like that? And I would just try and refine my sound. And within like a year, I had my first record out. So, um, so that's when I started taking it seriously. And after, after my first record, all oh, people started wanting to work with me, collaborate. And it just sort of, it, it, it kind of built from there. And then, and, Three years later, I was in the national charts in the UK, you know. And, and, and how difficult was it back then to get, like, your records pressed? Because it's not, uh, it's not like today, like, everybody just has a DAW and, and yeah, there are a lot yeah. of distributors. Well, everything, everything from a technical point of view, everything back then, I mean, I started off with an Atari ST. Um, uh, and, you know, it, I had, like, a, a, an expander on it, which gave me four MIDI outs, and I had ACAC. One Akai sampler, one Cog synth, one Roland synth, and they're all going into this shitty little mixer. Sorry for my language, but um, and, and and it just you know you had to learn. The, the good thing about it was the good thing about it was you would learn your instruments. You know, you would learn them inside out. So you would learn the sampler inside out, and the and and, and by today's terms, all of the equipment back then. In, in by today's standards was very basic, but very difficult because you're working on these tiny little screens and you, you're working out analog and it was, it ended up being quite expensive. So you had time before you get your next thing. Now, nowadays producers nowadays just immediately have with the digital audio workstation, they have everything straight away. Now we had to sort of invest and, and spend time and, and like make some money and buy another piece of equipment, you know, just a tiny compressor, you, you know, and these things are on every channel of a door. So it's, it was, it was a different time. It was a different time, but, um, you know, the good thing about it was that you, you learn every part of the process rather than just having all this stuff in front of you. And I'm not taking anything away from because some great new producers out there, But they never had to learn each and, and purchase each little bit of equipment like a sampler or a, an analog synth. And, and, and you have the time to learn it because you have, um, you know, a long time to wait until you have enough money to buy your next piece of equipment. You know, <laughs> so it's like it, that, that's how it, that's how it kind of progressed. And, and obviously with the collaborations, they, you know, it, we ended up pushing each other on to, um, To, to sort of be better on every track uh, and and nice yeah and and that's that's kind of how it sort of unfolded time i've got to turn this alarm i i set i set an alarm <laughs> on my phone to say that i'm i'm talking to you guys and it is going off so yeah i'm back to you now yeah okay, don't worry <laughs> no, but the good thing i can imagine is that 
you got to learn a lot from all these friends that you're collaborating with and everybody kind of like shared the, the knowledge and and the connections yeah. i can imagine yeah well that, that's the thing i mean I, i worked with mainly djs and um well only djs really um not other producers um from the start of having records out so what they brought to the table was well you know they would put a record on and say well, this is what works on dance floor and i'd go hmm well what about this and i would make something and they go yeah 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 like that have you heard this you know and i think you know with progressive house i think that's the way it's gone i, I think i think everyone has just taken the the ideas from things and and uh, uh, from 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 other people's tracks and gone oh i like the way that kick drum sounds or oh i like the way that sounds and everyone has just sort of built upon it over over time and we used to we used to put on records that we thought were would inspire us in a studio session now you're not copying them you're just saying have you heard this and shit yeah that's really good how can i be that good you know and yeah. I, i remember having a conversation with john kramer and stefan k about this and like when lexicon started building up and uh, we said look we have to admit you know when we before we start a session we put your records on he said oh, okay. <laughs> and he said to me, <laughs> they said to us oh shit we do that with your records <laughs> <laughs> So they used to put on Lexicon Avenue records and we used to put on Kramer and K records and then in the end, you know, we ended up um, doing remixes for each other, you know? Yeah, but the good thing is that if if you listen to the progression of the tracks during the time, now that you're yeah. telling us this, you can see yeah. how every each every then it kept on escalating as a, uh, in the progressive sound. Yeah. And, and yeah. getting better in the, in, in the production. Getting better sense. in so, production yeah. as well. And you've got to remember that the, you know, not only did um you know that's time as well and that's technology moving on you know if you listen to uh, some of the productions back then and they were limited to a to to the medium as well so they had to be so if you put a track on now from back then yeah you say oh that's a great track but it's in a sort of narrower field where now people are producing in the digital era it's you know you've got so much more scope not just because of the technology but because of the medium it's going out on i mean digital has a higher band and like a higher frequency range to work within whereas when it goes to vinyl there's certain limitations with regards to bass and with regards to the tops you know they had to be pulled down and and in so that's why if you listen to something from sort of 2003 it won't sound sonically as bright or as deep as as something from like if as something now in 2023 has you know more bandwidth more basically sonically um more depth because you you, you the the medium of vinyl required that you you couldn't have so much width so much bass so much top you know uh, and 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 you know the sounds naturally progressed as the technology's progressed but also as the medium's progressed you know everything's in digital now which is you know it gives you more scope so yeah well, well and, and a lot of the things had to be mono so before to be yeah mono exactly well yeah. you had mono below i mean literally like below a certain frequency like uh, i think like around 100 hertz if you had anything in stereo in the bass end of your track the needle like if you press that the needle would literally jump out of the record so it would be it would be an unplayable record because of yeah. because of the medium um so you know you, so you had a limited so if you listen to things they sound a lot narrower anyone's tracks from back then on vinyl than they do now because we live in a digital world but um i mean going back to that sort of thing i mean we as as artists were inspired with the kind of forward thinking sounds of uh danny tanaglia um really back in back at back at those times with 96 97 you know we we actually ended up doing for dmc a remix of look ahead by danny um and, and he just had this whole we were kind of in awe of that whole 
Twilo, that whole that that whole New York sound that was just just so much different uh, to to anything else you'd heard, and we sort of incorporated that, but with our own coming from a deep house background into a tougher um, sort of beat scenario than we did the, with with the deep house, and I think if you're looking for inspiration from you know transitioning from the deeper house to the progressive i think danny tanaglia i think for everyone yeah of definitely. my group <laughs> of my age group was um the the the, the guy to sort of go wow what's he going to do next you know yeah uh, it's it's so cool to hear i mean it's it's funny because my next question was my next question was going to be how you're immersing yourself in the hardware and the technology and, and the music making process, but what were the sounds that you were inspired by to go and create music? And it's that DT sound you just answered. Yeah, yeah the DT sound. You know, when, um, um, you know, when the, the whole, when the whole tribal um, sound came out, you know, we were like, wow, you know, you, you had the US tribal level and you had the tribal um, over here, the European ones, the DJ vibe was was really tearing it up. But yeah, I think the DJ vibe was like the Danny, the, the European yeah. Danny Tenaglia. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. We we played with him in Portugal a few times. Like he was like a he was like a don in Europe of of, yeah. of the sound, you know. And and you know those guys, those guys really pushed it forward. I, I think from from a you know from the point of view of. Um, of like throwing things into into uh, tracks and making it cohesive, but unlike anything you'd ever heard before, you know. Uh, and 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 what what we really loved about Danny was the fact that he could like have this really tough sound and have these great noises coming in, but then have a lot of soulful stuff in there. You know, like 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 really soulful vocals would just come out of nowhere in amongst all this darkness, you know, it, it just, just different. It was just, it was just like, wow. Yeah, this is new, you know? I, I totally get you. Definitely. It's, yeah. it's, it's a mind blowing kind of thing. It changes yeah. your life. Yeah, yeah. It, it really was. It, it did for us. It did for us in the studio. It did for us in the, you know, in like moving forward and pushing ourselves to try to go darker, but at the same time, try to be, um, Uplifting, dark and uplifting is quite a combination if you get it right. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, the the one of the cool things and that I've been talking to Will is is how how your sound got to got to manage both of those things, but in 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 different instances because and that was what I think was really really interesting about the whole Chris Cat sound that it's like. Okay, there's Mexican Avenue over here. It's like this kind of uh, tribal in the background, but progressive in the sense of a forward thing with some yeah. darkness and, so, and a little bit of light. Then there's this Echo Man sound that is just like so pop and, and the kind of track yeah. that you want to put in this in, in, in that moment of the night where it, everybody's just going to throw their hands in the air like, oh my God, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's so I, lovely. I think, I think I'll uh, definitely the lexicon sound was more influenced by Danny's sort of tribal approach to things. I think more the Echo Men sound was more our backgrounds in the eighties kind of sound, you know? So the melodies, although, you know, can be construed as being uplifting, they were quite melancholic as well. You know, they were quite, they could be quite, um, Dark in themselves, the melodies, but but also, um, you know, uplifting. It's a hard one to get. It, it's, you know, it's 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 kind of looking for those notes. When you get a nice pad, it was for me. It was kind of looking for those notes that just didn't quite. They, they weren't the quite the, the convention that would be sitting within that melody range and just just do something that might put a lump in your throat. You know, might 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 make you think, oh yeah. You know, but at the same time, be a little bit melancholic. And I, I, I tried to do that when I wrote the vocals for uh, Perpetual. And, and oh my god, <laughs> my favorite! It's like my favorite track. I, I played it so many times. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. So <laughs> much. 
<laughs> yeah, and and I think that that was mainly about. I mean, you're in different points of your life, and for me, I mean, there's only like eight lines in it, you know. Um, but I think trying to condense how you're feeling into those eight lines to make it not such a such a um, a challenging thing for people to hear on on the dance floor. Um, I think that was quite a, a, a difficult thing for me to achieve, but at the same time, it simplified the production process. But that in particular was about um, what I was going through personally at the time, which was a relationship which was in meltdown, you know? And you try to, you know, not say, hey, I'm in a relationship that's in a meltdown. You try to put it into, you know, other words and... and um, uh, and uh, and it seemed to work. It seemed to resonate with people. So yeah. I was happy about that. They're yeah. out of the darkness. It's a, it's it's just a yeah. <laughs> I wanted to let you know, man. Like even before I even thought of, uh, even before super progressive, this channel was a thing. When I was just first falling in love with aggressive house music over the pandemic, it was perpetual bro that I turned to. <laughs> that was my reference track. It's like what is other music that sounds like this yeah this balance of all this different stuff going on this it's like how do i feel this and this at the same time and where can i find more tracks like that it <laughs> really was like a like north it was Will like a nothing. northern star for me in this progressive <laughs> oh, oh, music i was like that's it nothing yeah, sounds like echo man it's just oh my god it's so rich thanks man yeah. thanks very much but it then then again if we go back to the production thing if you put it on if i play it in sets now I've got to boost the bass and I've got to boost the tops because of the digital stuff around it. However, at the time, you know, it, it fit into so many people's, um, into so many people's consciousness. That's why we, we, we did, it, it just was everywhere. Everywhere we went, it was being played and stuff. And we were like, oh my God. And then, you know, you go to Russia and places like that and, and everyone's singing along and yeah, it's just like blown away. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's, the, it's the baseline and, and, and just just the groove like you you know, you knew as a DJ when to play it is what it was like a, a that not at the peak time, but at, like almost near the end. Would you just want to take that soulful song that just will make everybody lose yes. their hearts? And it just like yeah. connect. it was amazing. Amazing. Well, that's that's the, the, the that's 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 lovely to hear. And I, I, I thank you for that. Um Oh, thank you. you. Know, when, <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're in the studio, you know, you, you're kind of thinking, well, where can I take this that, that isn't the same as something else that I've heard? And, uh, and, and, and that was it. I think, um, you know, the first, the first Echo Men thing we did uh, with a vocal on was uh, a track called Through to You. And we yeah. did it for Huge Tunes. And Jerry, who owned Huge Tunes, was very specific and he used to get you to change stuff all the time. And I had this synth line in going, bow, bow, ba da bow. Um, and I'm down, 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 down. Another synth from a Jupiter 6. And I was playing this melody with that. And he said, can you turn that into a vocal? And Anton said, well, you know, Cheb Grim, who plays keys uh, in this jazz funk band and stuff, um, why don't we get him to sing? And I was like, okay. So I turned those synth line melodies into a vocal just with those simple words, you know, and that's what sort of kicked it off. That was obviously before Perpetual. And, you know, doing that, going through that process in the studio, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of like putting a jigsaw, I know it's a cliche, but it's kind of like putting a jigsaw puzzle together and thinking, well, what can I do? What can I do to make this better? And, um, you know, sometimes vocals are the answer and sometimes they're not, you know, but uh, in that, in, in those two instances, vocals were the answer. Yeah. It's a great track. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great track. <laughs> Chris, it's, I Very love much. that comment, like tracks like Orient and. Orient oh was God. our first ever one. Yeah. 2000. And 2000. Well, uh, the other thing that I was talking to Will the other day is that how, how, how is it that we got like somebody like 
Danny Howells, right? Like, like that it was emerging at that point in life. And, yeah. And yeah. suddenly when he gets like this big opportunity, like the new breed opportunity, like Global Underground yeah. was, at that time was like, like huge. And the thing that he said was like, you know what? I'm going to get Chris Scott to open the <laughs> yeah. door for me. Like, Chris, like, take me there. Like, give me yeah. this. He, he played like four or five tracks. Yeah. Once. Yeah, yeah. And I that think new breed there's, album. There's four on there's four of mine on Danny's new breed. Uh, someone told me a statistic. I'm not sure if it's true, but I am producer with the most tracks on Global Underground compilation. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. That that that's questionable. Someone else told me that. Um, and I I haven't done the I haven't the done the stats. You know. <laughs> I mean, we monitored, obviously, what was going on with forensic tracks that were licensed there. But when we did remixes for other people, uh, um, you know, for other labels, you don't really monitor what's going on with the compilation stuff. And this is kind of embarrassing, but it's only like four years ago that I found out that um, on John Digweed's um, GU, he had our remix of um, Medway, my release. Yeah. I only found that out four years ago. But you oh, know? my God. <laughs> that, I, I still remember, like, my release. Oh, my God. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That is a fantastic remix. Yeah. Well, Jesse's a, Jesse's a good friend uh, now. I, I, I never spoke to him until about three years ago. We never, our paths never crossed. Um, but he's such a cool guy, originally from the States and living in the UK now. Um, just such a cool, cool guy. And he's, he's put some amazing tracks together. Um, but yeah, for, at, the, at the time, the global underground stuff, you know, it was, it was based in Newcastle. And so it was, it was very close to us. But that wasn't the reason that we got picked by, you know, Danny. I mean, there was the two projects on there. There was um, the Lexicon and the Echo Man stuff on Danny's thing. And I was just like, where I got sent this CD and I was like, hang on, like four of these tracks are mine, you know, um, or ours. Um, and it didn't, because you were working on the next thing, it didn't really sink in so much at the time, you know, and then, and then now people tell you that, you know, it's part of the progressive history and stuff like this. But at the time, um, that I'll, I'll remember the story for the rest of my life, I was working. So I lived in this, uh, well, I live in this little town not, uh, south of Durham, which is south of Newcastle. Um, and, you know, we'd been over to work with Satoshi Tomi in his place in New York. And he could come over to Bishop Auckland, this tiny little town in, in like an old mining town. And, uh, People, you know, who were into progressive, they'd spotted him. They were writing into DJ magazine. Say, they had this, this feature saying uh, DJ spot. And someone had spotted him in a McDonald's in Bishop Auckland <laughs> with, with Lexicon Avenue. Um, and, and stuff like that was happening. I'll never forget. Um, we were working in the studio at my, at my house, which is like the basement in my old house. And... Um, and um, Satoshi got offered his um, new breed while he was at my house. And James, who was wild, James, who, uh, who was the partner in, um, it, at the time in, um, in Global Underground, came up the street. And I lived on a bank, which was like that. And he had a rear wheel drive Porsche and it was icy. Uh, there was snow everywhere and he just skidded around the street and bumped into one of my neighbor's cars, you know, <laughs> and the police arrived and everything. <laughs> he told me to go and hide his stash. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was the night that Satoshi got offered his uh, Global Underground. It was, at, it was at my house, you know? <laughs> so It's so cool. I, I have a question for you because I'm kind of like, uh, I'm really curious. You have such a unique uh, combination of perspectives on how this works because you're a producer and yeah. you're the label boss. What does it look like? 
Was it always kind of a different story with each track finding its way onto a GU? Or was there kind of like a standard procedure where these tracks would make their ways onto their records? Basically, what I'm asking is, is yeah, like, yeah. what I is mean, that process like? Well, the, the process at the time was, you know, we would send promos out to DJs and they would just use them. And if we, if we, we held back on the release, because everyone wants an exclusive... I mean, I'm doing a, a guest mix for uh, Balance next month. Oh, no, in two weeks. That's I'm sick. Doing a, Represent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there'll be a few of these on. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so, so, you know, you try to get, you try to get exclusive. So the guys, would, we'd send promos out and they'd say, well, can you hang, hang back on this and we'll use it on a, on a GU. And we'd, but that's with the forensic stuff. But obviously... You know, there was stuff being used on Saw recordings, on Hooch tunes that we'd done, you know. So, yeah, it just, it just worked that way. You know, we didn't try to work them in there. It wasn't like anyone was pushing them. It was just what they wanted to play, basically. So they yeah, were into it. So we, if you didn't play the Lexicon Avenue sound, you, you just didn't play progressive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. It, it, it's, it's, it was everything, it, it, everywhere. It was everywhere. It's, it was, it was everywhere. You know, it was kind of, yeah, it, it, we, we had this dark sound. I mean, that, um, you know, the, the first thing we did was a very housey, but really fat, um, it was called Here I Am. And um, we got this uh, fax, fax from <laughs> DJ. <laughs> fax. Yeah. <laughs> We got a fax from Deep Dish saying, oh my God, I remember it word for word. It was, oh my God, Lexicon Avenue, here I am, makes me want to die uh, because our work sucks compared to this. And we were like, fuck off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe Deep Dish is saying this. So um, Scott Bradford still has the fax somewhere. So we licensed it to Deep Dish, uh, which was DDR at the time. And then it obviously became Yoshi Toshi. Um, and everyone started playing that. And they, they said, look, can you do us a harder version of it? And Mark, who was in with us at the time, said, how about we go down this route? And we kind of made it sort of our own version of Tribal, um, which was darker and everything. And, uh, and it worked out. But then we did this thing where, oh, my God, we sampled a chant from the beginning of a movie uh, on a track for Forensic. And being naive Northeast England guys, we didn't realize the um, the significance of the actual chant. And it was from the beginning. We used to sample off movies all the time. But it was from the beginning of an exorcist movie. Anyway, it turned out to be the Islamic call to prayer, um, which <laughs> oh. on Midnight on West 27th, which is yep. on Danny's Newbury. <laughs> which everybody so, played, of course. <laughs> yeah, everybody played, but we had no idea the significance of it because there wasn't any of those communities in our area where we would hear that and know what, it, what the significance was. So um, I, I tried to, you know, sort of bury that track because, um, you know, it caused a lot of issues at the time. But And I can't believe people didn't learn from that lesson because other people have tried to use that in tracks or in DJ live sets and got themselves into a lot of trouble. I've seen so, that go down. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's, you know, that was the naivety of youth and, 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 you know, the predominantly, you know, non-Muslim area that we were from. And, and I, I've apologized, but I've had guys from Pakistan get in touch with me recently and say, you know, I think it's beautiful that you used it in a track like that and they play it. Whereas others take offense to it. You know, the hard line is so, Wow, I can't believe I touched on that subject. I usually try to. I usually no, try no, to. No, no, you're very, but, but, you're very but, but, but respectful else? of of the issue. I, it's class, yeah. bro. Yeah, totally. No, no. What I what I really think about the track is that when whenever I hear it, because it's it's never you never hear it at the beginning of it. So you hear it when when it's gonna get serious. Like okay, here yeah. it is. But, yeah, and it, it it just it just sounds so majestic. It just it just lightens up, and everybody's like deep into it. It's it's so, yeah, yeah. So, but, the groove but, but is we, just. I, I I could never play it again, and you know I can I can you know. I can only um, um. When when I talk about the track, I can only um, focus on my naivety about using that sample and not realizing the significance to certain people. So, you know, it it 
it, it, it's it's a yin and yang thing about that track. It's a it's kind of like yeah, it was a good thing, but also it was a you know potentially offending thing. And so I I, I try not to. I, I brought it up. <laughs> I know I did, but no, um, no, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah but 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 you know, I, I was worried for for a long time after that when when I was informed about the significance of it and our uh, uh, inability to recognize that that even though it was part of the movie to use it in a, in, in record was probably the wrong thing to do. So, uh, but you know, that it's out there on the global underground CD. That you yeah. Can buy. And then, uh, I think Steve Lawler played it in the new movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. like, and that one went really big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so we had that period and then, you know, we, 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 um, you know, after that, everything, I think, I think mainly after we did, so we did um, Depeche Mode only when I lose myself. Oh, that's what I was going to ask about. My God, that bass line. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, the, that's the thing we were trying to come up with. And I was in the studio. I was trying to work out the best notes to go to, to, to fit around the whole vocal. And they were dead simple. But. I was using, um, I, I had the Jupiter 6 on and I was using like, instead of, because at the time we were doing like dum 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 rhythmic ones. Mm -hmm. But to work out the notes that work best, I was just using a sustained note, like boom, 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 that thing. Yeah, go to and, reset. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and we were like, it sounds great just like that. Why do we need to cut it up into a rhythmic thing? Let's just keep it like that, you know? And um, that's how it sort of developed. But we let we 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 had a massive long intro before that 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 bass hit in. And the only thing because it was Depeche Mode, we had the acapella. Um, we cu we couldn't release it commercially, and we gave it to like fifty at that year's Miami Winter Music Conference. We gave it to like fifty K DJs on CD, and. Um, and it, it it went huge, but then one of the recordings of it got one of the CDs got into the wrong hands, and someone bootlegged it to vinyl and made an absolute fortune out of it. They made like so much money; it, they sold so many. Everybody and then there, were, <laughs> there were people bootlegging the bootleg as well. So there's so many different vinyl versions of it, and we never saw a penny. It was just a promotional thing from our point of view. Um, but on the flip side of that, that kind of really blew it up for us. So we were traveling everywhere. You know, John Digwood was playing it weekly in every gig, and so and so was Danny and, you know, I think it's Sasha. Yeah, so, you guys so everyone, put, it in, put that bass line in, in, your, in your website, I remember. Yeah. Like, into yeah, the world. Yeah. So yeah, deep yeah, in the baseline, I'm, I was like, my God, what is this website? <laughs> that was the oh, website intro? The that was the website. Dude, yeah. it, 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 was, it was the baseline and, and, yeah. and the words from yeah. the Lexicon Avenue track. Like, we're from, from the other Lexicon Avenue track with the baseline from the, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, like, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Into a world where your deepest yeah. desires and, and the yeah. haunting baseline. Oh, I, I, I can't forget it. I still play it like in my mind, like, dude, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as, 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 even though that, that sort of the memory of that is tainted that somebody else kind of made it big out of that track themselves personally, we can't, you know, we, we try to, um, you know, uh, rationalize it by saying, well, look, you know, this got us really international. And, um, and so, yeah, we, you can't have any complaints when, when it does that to your career, you know, um, it, even though I would really like to find out who the hell <laughs> bootlegged yeah. it <laughs> and say, where's my money, mother? <laughs> and, and there's a lot of people that made a lot of money from just from those kind of white labels. They, they were called white labels back then yeah. because they, they, they were impressed by anybody. It's just there wasn't a label to sign. So it was it was just like a like the, the vinyl was a, just white. Yeah, and, the, and the vinyl. You know, on the run out of a vinyl, you're supposed to have the uh, the number the, the, of the pressing plant. They were scratched off. <laughs> so the pressing plant, the pressing plants themselves, whoever manufactured those, um, they were just as culpable as the people who bootlegged it. You know, so yeah. But 
you know, pressing vinyl now, going back to what you said, pressing vinyl now is so much more expensive because we're looking at doing it. It's the 25th anniversary of Forensic this year, and we're looking at a vinyl box set. And nice. um, That will be amazing. Yeah. yeah, very limited run of each track. And the ones we are picking are... Now, it all depends on me getting the parts because everything back then was recorded stereo down from all this MIDI equipment, some of which I have, some of which I don't. So it depends on getting the parts, but the vocal parts are very important. So there's going to be a lot of work involved in me recalling the vocal parts because we weren't working on doors like we mm -hmm. are now, you know. Um, but we have picked five tracks um, that were forensic tracks, that were classics that still have, you know, um, like a demand on discogs. Okay. They, they will be on one side with Big Name Remixer on the other side Ooh. as a vinyl box set for the 25 year. Oh Five my God, vinyls. that is amazing. That is fantastic. Thanks. That, that's the plan. That's the master plan. How we execute it is, you know, at the moment it's still in flux, let's say. No, so, I cannot imagine that you're, because you're like remastering these tracks and it gets like a... Yeah. It's more to do with getting the part. So it's actually getting the vocals that we use because as I say, everything was like, I have like a, a two Akai's here um, and neither of them will fire up. And that's what I used to, so whenever I used to record a vocal, I used to record it down to a digital and then I used to put the parts into the Akai's. I used to split them up and put them into the Akai's and, and they're not working at the moment. So it's, it's going to be a really difficult process to try and get those parts, but You know, we've already got like three guys on board, three nice, nice guys on board. So we've got Lexington Avenue just till dawn planned um, with a, a remixer on the other side, which will be like two guys who everyone knows. Um, <laughs> we, we have a target for one guy for Ekman Substance, which we haven't confirmed yet, but we have a target. Uh, remixer for that. Um, we have agreed um, Little Green Men Need uh, Satoshi Tomi remix on one side. Mm -hmm. Dean Ox and Beckers on the other. Cool. Um, and we have another couple of names like um, who have agreed to these things, but it's getting the parts to them. And it's the lead in times, you know, the reason it was so competitive and so cheap to manufacture vinyl back 20 years ago was there was so many pressing plants around after the dig at the, you know, after digital took over downloads and streaming, all these pressing plants went out of business. So now they're coming back into business, but they're like a cottage industry. They're a small industry. So the costs are through the roof where they used to be very competitive. So it's like, it costs five times as much now to, press a vinyl and it did 20 years ago you know i can imagine yeah, yeah. can i ask so you something about uh forensic yeah one one question i have is like you had all these productions what inspired you ruben was taking me through your discography and we saw all the aliases now yeah. from the start like what inspired you to go out not only on top of all the work that goes into producing tracks but set up a record label your own record label rather than maybe forming a relationship with a pre-existing one that would kind of be your creative outlet? Yeah. I mean, we, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, what was happening was that we were getting more and more uh, labels who were taking our stuff, you know, from sort of 93 with the stuff that I was collaborating on from 93 to sort of 97 And they were just getting scattered everywhere. We had like we had stuff on Junior Boys on on Limbo and and all these other labels. And we were like, you know, we, we we're putting this everywhere, but we have no control over it, and we, we can't say what's happening with the tracks once they've gone. Um, and we we're making enough material, and we have people who you know who are digging our stuff who obviously like to con contribute. Why don't we just do it ourselves, you know, and, and just keep total control over it? So we know what's getting manufactured. We know, um, you know, it, it's it's not sketchy when it comes to transparency about how many we're selling and things like that, you know? So we thought, 
let's just do it ourselves. So that's, that's, that's kind of how it happened. So we all had a meeting, we had a dinner and said, yeah, let's do it. And Bill Brewster, who's like a famous sort of house music, um, commentator and author, um, he was part of the original lineup of, of the, of, of the thing. And, uh, that's where forensic records came from. He actually came up with, um, um, Little Grey Men for one of our project names, you know? Um, um, and, and I think he said like forensic records and the tagline at the time, because in 97, 98, we were doing deep house was deep house from the deep North. That is sick. <laughs> that is <laughs> sick. <laughs> uh, and 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 that, and that's what that's what he came with because he's a creative writer, you know. So he came up with that sort of stuff and was involved for a few years, and and then you know we went more more and more progressive, and wasn't his bag, and and we kind of bought his chairs out, and then we kind of whittled it down, and 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 yeah, we just went about it. It was just like got you know. It, you look back now and, and people tell you, oh, this was, this was amazing for me. And that, that was great for me. And I love this record. And at the time it was just work for us, you know, it was uh, like, yeah. yeah, you know, so what's, we're the, next thing? what's the next thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. In the studio. Right. That's that remix done. What's next? Come on. And you know, we do that and do our next track, you know, at the same time, we didn't lose sight of the, of the sort of uh, the creative side of it. We always pushed each other to, um, be better in each production but you know we had a heavy schedule it was like we you know we we need we've got a deadline for this remix and we're like going to tokyo next week so you know we have to finish it so it kind of became it kind of became you know any, anything any line of work with a level of repetition becomes work you know um it, it, even though you know, you know, but we were in so much of a flow back then. Can you see me? Yeah, you're good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my my phone just gave me that um, low battery thing. Let me just plug this in. Um, yeah, so everything just became a you know like a, a thing where we, you, you know, you, you have a day. You, right, we've got this day to work on the track. We have to get it done. Uh, because we're traveling on, like, we're traveling on Thursday. It's Tuesday. We need to finish this because if we don't finish this, we'll have to do it when we get back and that we'll miss the deadline. So it became like a schedule of, of, of work and stuff. And it, it, but it didn't, it didn't ever fuck with the, uh, excuse me. It, it didn't, oh, ever mess with the, uh, it didn't ever mess with the creativity side of it. You know, it just, um, it, it seemed to work. Everything seemed to just fall into place every time. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know. How sometimes, like a sometimes, kind of a deadline just like lights a fire a little bit. Not like a harsh yeah. deadline, but like you gotta get shit done. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Hey, Chris, and, and exactly. on tracks like the like the remix for for Breed for Danny Howells, like what yeah. what was the inspiration behind it? Because it's kind of like a really vocal vibe yeah. house, but with the with the Lexicon Avenue deep. Yeah. Music. Yeah, what, normally when I get when I get a vocal track to remix, I pre, I much prefer working with vocals. Um, when, and when I do get a vocal track to remix, I just I just do, I ignore everything else that isn't the vocal and just build a track around the vocal that's my own, you know, for a remix. And obviously, Danny was playing our stuff, and to get that from him and hearing. A re -re now, in my commercial years, when I was working for Warner Brothers, I'd actually worked with a re, -re prior to that um, on, on a track. Um, so I knew her voice, and I was just like, Danny's track's great. We've got to give him something completely different so that we complement it, you know? Um, and, um, and, yeah, we just... You know, we had this thing where we would tame each other. Like, you know, Mark would be good at saying, no, don't bring that in yet. Don't bring that in yet. Whereas I would be, you know, like, look at this. I'm going to tune this percussion to the track. Go on then. And it would take ages. And then we'd just like, right, we need this effect. And Scott would be like, yeah, we need some, we need some melody in here. We need some, and, and, and it, it, we just bounced off each other like that. 
and and it was hard work you know it was it was as well as being a beautiful thing it would be because you're working with all these live midi stuff you know you that's another part of wanting to finish a track because if you didn't finish it you would have to try and recall it because you work on another project like say if oh, I, okay. oh, yeah. I have to go in and recall manually all the analog synths all the mix and set mixer settings and stuff and it was just a nightmare. Never say if if you didn't finish a track and you went back to the one you were working on with it all being in MIDI and all these uh, outboard uh, MIDI devices, you know it would it, it it never sounded the same when you yeah. went back. <laughs> you know? um, so so you wanted to get it finished, and uh, I think we did that in like two or three days of intense work. Uh, the one wow. the, the Danny Howells remix. I still yeah. play that track. It's amazing. I love that track. You know, the, the one thing about that track was in the transitional period where I was still using an Akai MPC and some of the timing on it, you know, yeah, it drifts. I, I had to edit it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to push, you have to push and pull that vinyl because <laughs> it, it yeah. drifts. It, it drifts. drifts. Yeah. And it, it, was a, it was a challenge back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's that's down the technology back then. That's not on me. That's down to the Akai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blame those guys. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> that yeah. precisely Blame that's that what I Akai. remember about it. Like, oh, my yeah. God, fighting with the pitch. Like, my God, what is this? Yeah, yeah. What happened, you know, at the time I had to sort of MIDI clock it to Cubase, but the MPC just had this, even though it was all digital anyway, it just had this sound and this groove that was great. But when you MIDI clocked it to your, to your um, sequencer, is what we called them before doors. When you midi clocked it to that, it would drift in and out of time, you know? So it was like, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a headache for me when I heard it afterwards. Cause when you hear it in the studio, it's okay because everything syncs up within itself. But like a, a, as, as a complete work, it would, you know, slow up and speed down ever so fractionally. So yeah, it was, it was, th that was the technology of the time. So sorry, sorry about sorry for everyone who uh, <laughs> everyone awesome. who, I'll, I'll take, I'll take that sorry. That, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> apologizing to anyone who played that track where it drifted out of time. Yeah. <laughs> play Mackay, don't play me. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. So that yeah, that's kind of the story of it all. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. Every now and then I, I go into YouTube and just type Lexicon Avenue and, and you just see like, oh my God, I, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a walk through time. It's amazing. Yeah. Amazing I music. think, you know, whoever posted the, uh, only there's one of the posts. I mean, there's several posts of only when I lose myself, one of them's got like 1.8 million hits or something. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. big. Uh, but some of them have like, you know, you get a couple with a hundred thousand and stuff like that, you know, several people have posted it. I wish I'd had the hindsight to do it myself, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you just, but, but, but I, I thought that at that point, I thought that maybe you guys, they were because it, 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 internet was limited. Like there, there's yeah. social media like today. I mean, somebody said at some point, like, uh, no, they got into trouble with the pitch mode and, and now yeah. they have to do like a remix as punishment. And everybody was like, what, what? Like, <laughs> well, actually, no. I mean, um, with the story is that Paul Oakenfall played um, our remix to Dave Garn of Only When I Lose Myself. Okay. And Dave um, was planning. So a couple of years later, Dave was already planning like a solo album. And he asked us personally to do um, the first single from it which was Dirty Sticky Floors. Yeah. Really nice track. Remix, yes. uh, remix yeah. yeah. So we so so we did that and you know. So that remix, yeah, as I said before, it like opened a lot of doors for us. So Yeah. <laughs> so we, we can't complain. Yeah. No. Very 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 good stories. It's, it's amazing. Amazing. Man. Uh, I'm just like a like a groupie fan over here. I'm like oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> but you know, you don't think about it that like that when you're doing it, you know, day in, day out. You kind of lose track about what other people, you know, you you you, you always have in mind when you create and um, you know, God I hope people like this. And and you try your hardest to make something that, that people will connect with. But you never kind of at the time think people are going to contact you, you know, 
10, 20 years down the line and say, wow, you know, this, this was the thing that, you know, I had people tell me that uh, Substance by Men kind of changed their view on house music and stuff, like quite a few people. And I'm like, really? And, you know, some of the South American guys get in touch and say, Echo Men, just like it kind of shaped me as a producer and stuff. I'm not going to name names, but the, like, you know, a few people have contacted me about that. So, and that means, that means a great deal to me, you know, because I see these people now and I, I, I listen to what they're doing and I just think, wow, this, this shit is mind blowing, you know? Um, and, and, and sort of be a part of their journey, you know, and, and, and for them to, you know, look back at, uh, at things that I've done, it's, you know, it, it makes you feel good. It makes well, you that's good. the thing is that we, we listened to those tracks at that time and said, this is mind blowing. Just yeah, exactly. people making the best <laughs> memories of their Dude, lives I, to your I, I music. Still, that's insane. When, when, I, when I play still, <laughs> when it comes to that point, I, I'm still looking at my, in my, in my USB drive. Like I need a, I need a, I need a perpetual track. Like where yeah. is my <laughs> perpetual track here? I yeah. like something like that. It's, it's well, it was, yeah. I still, see it. I see real. it in the groups, Ruben. You see it too. It's like the Lexicon fo- Lexicon Avenue and Echoman following is like serious in terms of how how much the fans love the music. It's like from someone who uh, didn't live through it. It's like cultish. I'm like, this is epic. These people like love this specific style of music. It's awesome. Uh, you know, you've made me today. You've made, me, you've made my month, actually. I know we're only early in the month, but you've made my month. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's nice. It's, it's, it's lovely to talk about, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm so um, grateful that you give me the chance to talk about it. Um, we have some really good new shit coming as well, though. Yes, you know, so, dude. So, yes, please, um, please tell us about the future. Yeah, yeah. Like, what, what's coming? Yeah. What's going on? Oh, well, what I told you about the 25th year anniversary, but we've also, um, you know, um, got some really who I think have had until until the until the the tracks are in the bag. I don't want to say too much, but like the people who I kind of really admire now, who want to get involved with forensic, it's just like, yeah, this is this is, you know, this is going to be excellent. Um, so really positive about that plus um you know i'm some labels that i play that i think are fantastic um i've been approached for remixes for so everything over this last two years and i'm kind of thankful for lockdown for this you know if it hadn't been for lockdown i kind of wouldn't have sorted a few personal things out and i also wouldn't have um wouldn't have really focused on, you know, what do I need to do with my life again and, and re reboot forensic and, and it's going so it's going better than I could have expected, you know, and, and, and touch wood or touch something yeah. that used to touch wood. Um, I, I'm, you know, we're going in the right direction and a lot of people who are into the classic progressive stuff are, uh, uh, contact me and saying, yeah, you are going in the right direction with this. And, and that's good because we, we, we kind of keep, we, we, we're trying to push forward and, and be current as well. And as well as like put our own creative side of it, but also try and keep the people who support us from the start happy with the output that we're putting out there. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's exciting times, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting times. I, I'm, 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 yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, just... when it, the, the people I've been speaking to over this last year and stuff who were, uh, you know, digging what we're trying to do and what we are doing and approaching me personally for remixes and, 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 and new material, it's, 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 it's kind of validating, you know, it, um, it makes it feel like it was a worthwhile endeavor, you know, that, 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 that we did, that, that, that we did restart it, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm so stoked for you that you get to drive positive energy from, from everything, you know, that you've put into your music career. Cause I know it can be, I don't know, difficult for all, all artists as time passes and we all go through different 
phases, but to see forensic and to see like this music be a positive, I don't know, a positive source of energy for you and something you're stoked about in yeah. 2023 is yeah. awesome. It's like, it's like, I, I get excited where it's not something you're running away from. It's like, no, you're leaning into it. This is like my life's work. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I, I have to mention here, you know, the support that I've gotten from um, people who have been, you know, and there's there's one guy in particular who, who's been in the scene for a long time and, and he's been such an inspiration for, like, remotely, but we have done a collaboration together and his latest track on, his last remix on Forensic you know, we've got videos of it there with John Digweed playing it and Nick Warren playing it and, and, and stuff. And uh, Dave Walker, as you know, we kind of send each other stuff when, when we sort of in the early stages of production and say, well, what about, it? look, you know, the EQs and we, we, the, everything that can, over, don't over compress this bit. And we're doing this backwards and forwards, you know, and having someone like that on your team it's just who, who's doing it for the passion as well. It's it's just great, and and, and I feel like we have a team. Even it, like there's the director, there's the three directors. There's us who who want this to be a a key thing, and we're making tracks together and stuff. But there's also like there's there's the fans from the original era and new people who are coming on board, and they're just pushing our stuff on socials, just taking their own time to do it, and that that. That sort of stuff, you know, it, it's invaluable. It, it, uh, it's 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 like how how do we deserve this this kind of support from people? You know, it, 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 and it it just makes you feel again. It's, deserved. it's, it's a lot of great work. It's a it's a yeah. whole body of, a whole body yeah. of work. It's amazing. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we we have like <laughs> a, like a for, like a forensic family thing going on. You know, where everyone's like sharing and 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 you know it. And 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 joining in group discussions and chats and and pushing like everything. A Facebook group. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh sick, sick. Yeah, it's called yeah. Forensic yeah. Family. No, I just know everybody's going to yeah, want to yeah, check yeah, this yeah. out. No, we've got yeah. the, we've got the Forensic Family. We've got the Forensic Records group, and we've got the Forensic Records fan page. The group itself, although I haven't been able to interact as much lately, when that started off, when uh, everyone from it, the old fans and stuff. A lot of interaction on there. If you look back at some of the earlier posts from like two years ago, it's just crazy conversation, just like real fun. It's become a bit more um, promotional now, which I, I don't want. I want to be able to interact more, but I'm getting more and more busy. It's like crazy. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, but we still have that sort of family vibe to it. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great. So Forensic Records, the group, and then there's Forensic Records, the fan page. And, and, yeah, I, I can I can give you the links and you can post them with this video if you oh, like. No, of course, uh, hell yeah, yeah please, please do, please do, yeah, yeah, excellent. Chris, I, I think that if you're gonna inject into this new phase of your life the the same passion and 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 yeah. love that you injected at that time, it's gonna be amazing, and 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 I'm pretty sure that you're gonna print us all again. I hope so, man. You know, I'll be, I hope I'll so. be really, really looking forward for it. Trust me. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, 30 years of doing it, I never thought I'd get this kind of passion back, but it's back. I, I'm, I'm stoked about everything that's going on at the moment. You know, that is how I am, bro. Yeah. And thank um, you, thank yeah. you for yeah involving me with it. This is all part of it. No, definitely. And I think, you know, this has been such, such an awesome conversation. Thank you. And yeah. I think an appropriate question to end with, and Ruben and I had kind of been going back and forth, like what is, because we're trying to think of like a good final question for, for different interviews. And our question to you is after everything we talked about, you know, super progressive covers the history of progressive house, but what is progressive to you? Yeah. Um, well, to me, you know, and, and I mean this with the greatest respect to other people who are into other, um, forms of house music with the greatest respect, because, you know, I'm 52 now and a lot of the people who I raved with, um, they much prefer if they do, you know, they've, they've raved, 
then they've had a family then the family's grown up and now they're getting back into oh i, I quite fancy I, I quite i quite want to go out and party again but all they want to hear is the old stuff you know whereas progressive to me it, i i think it's fundamental to house music in itself i mean the term in itself is fundamental to house music i mean you know from larry levan mixing disco records with a drum machine to where it is you know there was never a point where it stopped and stayed the same you know and and i think when you have the right people around you with the right like-minded people you know everyone sort of builds upon things and this is what we've we've already touched on i think i think that's what all of house music should be about it should be about it's and I, I i've said this before house music isn't isn't just a, a um a genre it's a it's a movement uh, house music is a movement you've seen it go from those gay clubs in 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 new york and chicago and and just spread across the world and it became a movement not by staying in the same place and i think you know more than anything progressive house even though it's had like certain periods of slumps where people have got into other genres and stuff like that i think it's it's the one thing that remains and i i think i think that's you know being part of a movement means that you move on and you push yourself to 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 um make something new make something that is progressive that doesn't stay the same that moves all the time that's constantly pushing itself forward and i think that's happening i think that's happening with you know you, you know you, you've got your south american sound and you've got your european sound and north american sound you know that everyone is trying to move the thing forward and 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 it's not forced it's a natural thing because everyone wants to you know be better or make something that makes people go wow i haven't heard that before and i, I think that's always got to be a part of it uh, as uh, fundamentally yeah awesome awesome it's like Very good. Uh, yeah Very. it's just much like what i've been learning about progressive is uh, it, it's so not just a genre of music and you can really attribute progressive to to really so much stuff. It's like your approach to the music, your approach to track selection, your approach to the arrangement. And then it, yeah. when it, and then when it, it starts to expand beyond the music into like life things, I'm like, yeah, this is touching my life in a way that I never could have anticipated, but it's like how I view the world now. It's really cool. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm so happy about that. And you know, and, and you know what, William, it's, it, it, it's great to see. I mean, I, I played a gig, I played a couple, couple of gigs recently where, where i haven't said that like in the uk that you haven't seen before in the uk for a long time where younger people are going now younger people go in south america younger people are starting to go in north america and israel and places like that but in the uk it's always it's it's like the progressive scene has always stayed like the older crowd where now you know i'm starting to see younger people sort of go yeah i like this music and that is really um encouraging for for the uk scene moving forward and you know the fact that you just said that and and that it means that to you you know and we can have a whole new generation that that's really that's that's just something you know it's it's uh it's it's a fantastic thing i, I love it yeah. Uh, I'm so stoked, bro. But uh, all I can say is thank you so much for coming on, Ruben, bro. You you're uh, Ruben. I am so stoked you're on this podcast, bro. This was the best <laughs> flowing conversation. Like, like this is gonna be great, Chris, dude. This this was such a treat. So awesome. Well, and, I and yeah, you, man, I'm a fan thank over you. here. No, I'm yeah. just a, a groupie here. <laughs> uh, thanks, man.